Well, good morning, everybody. Glad to see you all here. Uh, my subject, as you know, is environmental and resource economics. And I want to start uh, by stating my understanding of the theme of environmentalism. I think there are two aspects. Uh, one leading aspect is that continuing economic progress is impossible because of the impending exhaustion of natural resources. And then also that uh, economic progress, including much of the economic progress that's already behind us, is dangerous. And it's dangerous to the extent that it is possible because of alleged harm to the environment. And I want to address uh, both of these aspects, starting with the uh, issue of natural resources. I think the way that uh, the immense majority of people look at natural resources is they think natural resources are a gift from nature, and even uh, the immense majority of economists talk of nature-given factors of production. And the idea is that uh, these uh, nature-given factors of production are scarce. They come from nature. Uh, we can't create them. Uh, all that we are able to do is use them up. So the usual view is uh, we can expand our production of things like automobiles, refrigerators, whatever. But in the process, we are consuming an allegedly scarce, irreplaceable supply of things like uh, iron ore and copper, uh, petroleum, whatever, etc. Now, I'd like to uh, present an alternative uh, point of view, and that is to make a distinction uh, between two aspects of uh, nature's contribution to uh, natural resources. Uh, I think in one sense, we greatly overstate nature's contribution, and there's another sense in which we radically understate it. Uh, if we think that nature provides iron mines and oil wells and copper mines and so forth, we're enormously overstating nature's contribution. Nature does not provide iron mines, oil wells, etc. Uh, there is an enormous human contribution before you can have an iron mine or an oil well. Uh, you have to identify the useful properties of things like iron and petroleum. Uh, you have to know what they're capable of doing that's of value to us. And uh, you have to be able to uh, get at them uh, in a way uh, so as to be able to direct them to the satisfaction of our needs or wants. And in fact, uh, this derives directly from Carl Menger's theory of goods, uh, which was explained uh, yesterday or the day before uh, by one of the other lecturers, perhaps uh, Professor Salerno, I think, that in Menger's view, uh, we start out uh, in, in considering what makes a, th a, a good. He says a good is a thing. It's first of all a thing uh, which possesses certain properties which we have identified as capable of satisfying a need or want. So there has to be a human need or want. There has to be a thing with uh, such properties as make it possible for it to satisfy a human need or want. We also have to recognize the existence of those properties. We have to identify them. And then we have to have sufficient command over the thing so as to be able actually to direct it to the satisfaction of our needs. Now, for the immense majority of our ancestors, uh, such things as iron, copper, they were not economic goods. They existed. Uh, it, they were in the ground. But uh, in the Stone Ages, uh, people had not yet identified the useful properties of any of the metals. And before any of the metals could become economic goods, their useful properties needed, first of all, to be identified. And then, uh, even after people identified them, before they could become an economic good, uh, people had actually to be able to get at them and direct them to the satisfaction of their needs. Now, for example, uh, today, uh, we may know that there's a great deal of iron 
up on Mars. I think it's iron oxide that gives Mars its uh, reddish color. And we know the useful properties of iron, but we cannot get at that iron. Uh, we're not, we know the uh, core of the Earth is made of millions of uh, cubic miles of molten iron. Uh, we know what the iron could do, but we have no means of getting at it. And uh, even if uh, someday we can get at it, there's a further requirement, which Menger didn't actually develop. We have to have the ability to get at the thing in a way that uh, is economical. Uh, it may be within this century we'll send a rocket ship to Mars, and it may come back with a kilogram of Martian iron. But uh, if you keep the context, uh, this would not be uh, good if we have to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to send a rocket ship there and come back with five dollars worth of, of iron ore, uh, the process has not actually accomplished any good. So in order for a thing to be a good, we have to know its useful properties, uh, be able actually to get at it and devote it to the satisfaction of our needs and do so in a way that doesn't require an inordinate amount of labor on our part. And only if a thing meets all of those requirements uh, does it become an economic good and wealth. So uh, all of this uh, pertains to the human contribution to uh, natural resources insofar as they represent uh, economically usable, accessible goods. We are uh, creating the goods and wealth character of these natural resources. Nature provides the material stuff uh, but our activity is what lends the goods and wealth character to nature. Now, so far, uh, I've stated the human contribution and shown that nature's contribution is only very, very partial. But there's another aspect of nature's contribution, which is generally not recognized, and this is a truly immense contribution. Uh, I guess... Probably by now everyone has seen one of the uh, CSI programs or some equivalent and you know about uh, crime scene analysis. And uh, imagine that we uh, had a, a crime scene laboratory out here. Uh, they could take a soil sample and do a chemical analysis of it. Now wherever this truck pulled up and whatever uh, particle of the earth they decided to analyze, in principle it would always break down into some combination or other of different chemical elements. Now, if you think about it for a moment, the entire mass of the Earth, from the upper limits of the atmosphere, 4,000 miles straight down to the center of the Earth, is nothing but solidly packed chemical elements. Try to think of any material aspect of nature that is not some chemical element or other as yet uh, presently known or as yet unknown. Uh, so the entire mass of the Earth is really solidly packed chemical elements. And uh, there's all kinds of tremendous energy forces with this, uh, all of the winds, the tides, uh, the uh, heat from the Earth's core, uh, the discharge of electricity and thunderstorms, and maybe forms of energy we're not yet even aware of, uh, energy that holds the uh, molecules, uh, uh, the uh, electrons and neutrons and whatever, and quarks, uh, of, of atoms together. Well, uh, the point is that uh, nature's contribution to natural resources uh, is not iron mines and oil wells. It is actually the totality of all of the chemical elements. It's the totality of matter and energy. What nature provides is matter in all of its elemental forms and uh, energy in all of its forms. That's nature's contribution. And strictly speaking, nature's contribution is the matter and energy, uh, well, first and foremost of the, of the earth, but not limited to the earth. Nature's contribution to uh, natural resources should really be understood as the totality of the matter and energy in the entire universe. That's nature's contribution to natural resources. Now, if we think about it that way, and then we distinguish from this aspect of nature's contribution to natural resources. We look at the narrower concept of economically usable, economically accessible natural resources. What part of nature's contribution are we able to put to use to serve our own ends? Well, that is an infinitesimally tiny fraction of nature's total contribution. 
even now, if we look uh, just at the Earth, uh, the total of our mining operations, almost the entirety, not quite, but almost, uh, is first of all limited uh, to the roughly 30% of the Earth's surface uh, that is comprised of, of land. The 70% of the surface that's comprised of ocean, uh, with the exception of some offshore uh, oil wells, uh, that uh, is not part of what we are presently able to get access to or have not yet been able to. And uh, the extent of our mines is still measured in feet, not miles. So uh, the fraction of what nature has provided uh, just here on Earth that we are able to get at and devote to our purposes is extremely uh, small. And if you keep these facts in mind, I think it follows without too great difficulty that the supply of usable, accessible natural resources is indefinitely expandable. We can enlarge, we can progressively enlarge the fraction of nature that we uh, sufficiently understand and have sufficient physical power over to direct to our purposes. Now, what's required to enlarge this usable fraction of nature? Well, it's advances in scientific and technological knowledge and uh, advances in the uh, quantity and quality of capital equipment. Just think, uh, what fraction of the uh, chemical elements in the earth could we uh, get, get access to and uh, apply to our ends when our means of production were limited to picks and shovels? The, uh, there was uh, the same amount of the chemical element iron uh, in the earth in the year 1000 as there is today, in 1500, 1800. Uh, in 1800, when our technology was still essentially limited to picks and shovels, the only part of the Earth's iron that we could get at was within a fairly few feet of the surface. But now what happens when we develop uh, steam shovels and bulldozers? What happens when we develop the ability to sink deep mine shafts, have uh, immense machines that can lift uh, multi-hundred ton loads uh, and uh, what happens as we increase our ability uh, to separate compounds. Uh, I don't know which form of iron we could work first, whether it was iron oxide or iron sulfide, but uh, I know with petroleum, uh, you know, first of all, petroleum uh, only became a usable, uh, accessible natural resource in the late 1850s. Uh, people had awareness of petroleum before that time, but uh, just as something that uh, seeped into streams and poisoned the drinking water of cattle. But uh, in the late 1850s, it was recognized that you could make kerosene from petroleum, which you could use to uh, put in a lantern and have a, a source of light. And so at that time, petroleum uh, for the first time became uh, an economic good. It was added to the list of natural resources. But we certainly couldn't get at very much of it. Uh, what kind of drilling equipment did they have uh, in the late 1850s? You could only go down a few feet, and there were some types of petroleum compounds uh, that for quite a while were totally useless, uh, those with a high sulfur content. Uh, one of the great contributions of Rockefeller and Standard Oil was to develop the process of petroleum cracking that made it possible uh, to separate the sulfur from the petroleum and so made those uh, deposits useful. Well, what did that do to the supply of usable, accessible petroleum? It enlarged it. Uh, what happens to the supply of usable, accessible petroleum every time we succeed in being able to drill deeper, every time we succeed in being able uh, to move our activities into areas previously inaccessible? We're enlarging it. And similarly, uh, with all of the different elements, the supply of economically usable, accessible natural resources today and in the past, I would say that uh, the supply of every natural resource today, the usable, accessible supply, is vastly greater uh, than it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Why? Because with our more advanced uh, capital equipment, our greater ability to dig deeper, uh, move bigger masses of earth with the same labor, uh, separate uh, chemical compounds more easily because of more advanced scientific and technological knowledge, uh, we are in a position to gain access to a larger fraction of uh, virtually every 
uh, useful element and compound that is to be found in the earth. Uh, now, just think uh, uh, how we're in a position to uh, increase the supply of usable, accessible natural resources uh, beyond where we are today. Uh, consider the, uh, uh, the, the coming, uh, th- this century. Now, uh, as I've said, we've up to now been limited to the land. But uh, there are developments in science and technology that will make possible undersea mining operations. Uh, between robotics and fiber optics and one thing and another. And just think of this. This would open up uh, well, well over two times the uh, land area to which, the, the two times the surface area to which we've had access. What would be the effect uh, if we could uh, sink uh, mine shafts, which we wouldn't even have to use people in, uh, just uh, fiber optics and, and robotics, and we could start mining uh, not from a depth of a few hundred feet, but maybe five miles, 10, 15, 20 miles. Uh, What must this sort of thing do to the supply of usable, accessible natural resources? Well, obviously, the potential is there uh, to increase this uh, in far greater measure than anything we've had up to now. Uh, A further example along these lines, uh, geologists have known for a long time that uh, physically, there is more petroleum uh, in our own Rocky Mountain states uh, in the form of shale, in rock formations, rather than the usual liquid formation. But uh, there is more petroleum uh, on the order of a factor of 10 than all of the petroleum that exists uh, in the uh, Arabian Peninsula. Now, up to now, this uh, shale has not been an economically usable, accessible natural resource because the costs of extraction are too high so it just doesn't pay. But what will happen if and when we get a commercially feasible method of extracting uh, oil from shale? Well, that will uh, increase our usable, accessible supply of petroleum uh, by a a huge multiple. And then beyond that, on the horizon, uh, there's the possibility of uh, using hydrogen as a fuel. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. So the key is... Uh, the key to the supply of economically usable, accessible natural resources is the state of scientific and technological knowledge, uh, the state of capital equipment, and the key to that is motivated human intelligence. If you have a free, rational society where a large proportion of the population, a large proportion of the um, most intelligent, ambitious people go into fields like science, engineering, invention, and business and are thinking how can they uh, accomplish uh, advances and uh, people have the uh, economic motivation to do so, if whoever makes any significant contribution to the supply of usable, accessible natural resources will make a personal fortune from it, well, that, I think, is uh, practically a sufficient guarantee that the supply of usable, accessible natural resources will go on expanding uh, for uh, quite a few centuries to come. So uh, the way I put it in uh, uh, point C, uh, the economically usable, accessible fraction of nature's contribution can be indefinitely enlarged uh, against the backdrop of a practically limitless nature. And if you keep this in mind, uh, this idea that we are stuck with this scarce, precious stock of irreplaceable natural resources and we have to be at pains to reduce, reuse, recycle, uh, this is not uh, an appropriate conclusion if you understand the the nature of, of wealth creation. You'd have to do that if the world comes to be the kind that the advocates of that position would like to make it. If you have a totally uh, government-controlled, government-run economic system uh, uh, populated largely by unthinking zombies and with no one having motivation to do anything, uh, that will definitely be a world of dwindling supplies of everything and then you'd better be ferreting through garbage pails and whatever uh, to uh, save whatever you can. All right, let me turn now uh, to the next major aspect uh, that I want to discuss. Uh, the relationship between economic activity and the environment. And the usual view is that uh, economic activity and production 
are harming the environment. Uh, one thing after another is alleged to be doing uh, some sort of damage to the environment. And I would like to argue the diametrically opposite proposition, namely that production and economic activity by their very nature serve uh, systematically to improve our environment. And what I understand by our environment is the external material surroundings of human beings. And we can take as our starting point uh, the fact I referred to that the entire mass of the earth is solidly packed chemical elements. Uh, the entire mass of the earth, uh, the atmosphere, the crust, the core, everything is solidly packed chemical elements of one kind or another. And that is the totality of our environment, those elements and their uh, various actions and interactions. And whatever we, whatever we do, uh, the supply of chemical elements remains unchanged. Uh, all of our uh, economic and productive activity, if you look at it from the point of view of physics and chemistry, all of it, all of it consists of uh, taking various chemical elements uh, originally found in certain compounds, perhaps breaking them out of those compounds, uh, recombining them uh, with other elements, and moving their locations. So, for example, we might start with iron oxide uh, in the Misabi Range in Minnesota, and uh, this iron ore uh, gets to steel mills. Uh, they break uh, the oxygen away from it, uh, other impurities, and they may add some chrome and nickel or whatever, and they alloy it, and then we have uh, we end up with steel sheath, uh, girders, whatever, uh, uh, iron in, in more usable forms. And similarly with all of the other elements. Now, uh, we have the same supply of elements, but we begin, uh, there's iron and copper, etc., resting underground somewhere. And then at the end, we have the iron in the shape of uh, girders holding up buildings, uh, supporting bridges, uh, forming the fenders of automobiles, uh, the outside of refrigerators. And stop and think about this for a moment. Where is the relationship between the same chemical element, iron, uh, in, where is it in a better relationship to human life and well-being when it's under the ground or when it's in the products we've produced? Well, I think, obviously, in the products we've produced. And the whole nature and purpose of production and economic activity from a physical chemical point of view can be thought of as uh, rearranging the relationship between the nature given chemical elements and human life and well-being so as to make the same elements stand in a better relationship to human life and well-being. We're systematically increasing the utility of the various elements and compounds. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, compounds of carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, whatever, uh, they're resting in the bowels of the earth our economic activity uh, takes them out, uh, separates them, recombines them, and the result is here in this hot, sweltering day, we're sitting in an air-conditioned room. Uh, we have electric light. Well, I would say uh, those elements are serving our life and well-being much better in the way uh, that economic activity has rendered them than uh, if we had left them alone. So uh, if you think of the environment as the relationship of the chemical elements to human life and well-being, economic activity, the whole nature and purpose is to improve the relationship of what, of what nature has provided uh, to make our lives and well-being better. We're improving the environment. That's what we're doing when we have uh, economic activity. And I'd like to amplify this a bit and uh, uh, try to indicate how uh, the populations of species and the quality of water and air uh, support this proposition. The usual view is that uh, we, the human race, are wanton destroyers of uh, the lesser species. And we get daily reports almost how many have been exterminated uh, in the last 24 hours. But uh, that uh, is, is actually not the case. Uh, if not for our activity, we would not have uh, such species or such breeds as uh, uh, Angus cattle, uh, we wouldn't have uh, Persian cats or toy poodles. 
uh, we wouldn't have things like American Beauty roses. Uh, what we would have is uh, wildlife and weeds. Uh, that would be uh, the environment. That would be the nature of, of the animal and vegetable kingdom. And I would say, looking at this, that uh, we have uh, greatly multiplied those species of benefit to us. We are responsible for a radical increase in the population of cattle, sheep, horses, pigs, goats, whatever, chickens, uh, all the species that are a benefit to us, including little pets and the uh, kinds of uh, vegetables that are of, uh, of value to us and flowers. And we've uh, uh, deliberately improved their uh, genetics uh, through scientific uh, animal and, and plant breeding. And uh, so we have improved uh, the species that are a benefit to us. And at the same time, uh, we uh, attempt to uh, eliminate the species that are harmful to us. Every gardener wants to kill the weeds in his garden. No weeds in your garden. That's an improvement. Uh, we want to eliminate uh, dangerous animal species. Uh, if there are animals that are threats to our lives, threats to the lives of the animals we value, like wolves, coyotes, rats, rattlesnakes, lice, whatever, well, uh, at least before the environmental movement got very influential, uh, we were doing a very good job in uh, reducing the species that were harmful to us. So what we've done is not uh, randomly exterminated species. We've deliberately set out and uh, tremendously succeeded in multiplying the species of value to us and in radically reducing and in some cases eliminating the species that are harmful. Now sometimes there's a species that isn't a particular harm nor a particular benefit and maybe uh, it gets eliminated too. But uh, that's, I don't consider that uh, a major tragedy and anyone who's concerned uh, they're at liberty to try to save some specimens. Now uh, water quality if you ever want a good uh, simple test for water quality uh, if, you're, if you live anywhere near uh, the Mexican border uh, by all means uh, take a trip across and uh, uh, think about it before you do it but uh, you can try the water there. Uh, but uh, carry a supply of Imodium tablets or something like that because uh, I think you'd find, a, you'd find a major difference in water quality uh, between any first world country and any third world country. Why is the water better in a first world country? Well, it's better because the first world country has an economic system that's capable of producing large quantities of low cost pipe uh, to transport water uh, they have the equipment uh, to provide uh, purification of the water. So uh, the water is cleaner. Uh, a major product of the Industrial Revolution fairly early on was uh, being able to bring uh, large quantities of clean water uh, to people so they could avoid uh, some of the serious illnesses that are uh, born uh, by uh, unclean water. And similarly, uh, the reason... Uh, uh, the, the, the Industrial Revolution and low-cost iron and steel pipe and so forth, uh, that's what enabled us to have things like sewage systems. You know the custom of the gentleman walking outside on the outside of the lady on the sidewalk? Well, that goes back to the days when uh, carriages would go by, sloshing up a horse manure and human excrement too, because the open streets were the sewers. Uh, before the Industrial Revolution, uh, the, the horses were drop, making their droppings in the streets, uh, urinating in the streets. Uh, people were throwing slop buckets out the windows onto the streets. And then uh, we got uh, sewage systems and we got the automobile, which did away uh, with this incredible uh, nauseating pollution. This represented a huge improvement uh, in local air quality. So if you keep the context, uh, I think you'd have to recognize uh, that economic progress has done wonders uh, as far as species go, as far as air and water quality go. Now, um, I have a reference here. I think I'll come back to point four in a few minutes. Uh, let me uh, jump to this next major heading, uh, C, the intrinsic value doctrine. 
here I've been telling you uh, about the, how economic activity has improved the environment, but of course the environmentalists uh, have the opposite view. And every time you hear them, uh, you hear talk about harm to the environment. And I'd like to say that I think the, this can be explained on the basis of a different philosophical idea of what the environment means. What I mean by the environment is the external material surroundings of men, the external material surroundings of human beings. And I see the environment as deriving its value from its service to human life and well-being. I see uh, human beings as the source of value. Uh, value radiates outward from human beings and touches external material things to the extent that they are of benefit to the human beings. Things become valuable and good insofar as they serve human life and well-being. The environmentalists have a very different concept of the environment and uh, uh, its source of value. The environmentalists think of the environment as something existing in and of itself, uh, apart from any connection to human beings, and uh, deriving its value totally apart from any connection to human beings. They think that it has intrinsic value. They think the value resides in the thing, in and of itself, totally apart from any connection to human life and well-being. Their view is similar here uh, to the Marxist labor theory of value in a way. Uh, you may have already heard in some of the other lectures that uh, Marx would think that uh, something had value uh, just by virtue of the fact that labor had been applied to its production. It was valuable intrinsically because labor was in it. Well, the environmentalists have a similar idea. They think that uh, mountains, rivers, uh, rock formations, uh, they're valuable in and of themselves, totally apart uh, from any possible usefulness uh, to uh, human beings. And so that's uh, the alleged intrinsic value. And let me give you a quotation uh, from a, a well-known environmentalist, two of them actually, uh, on this subject. Uh, this is from a book review that appeared uh, some years back in the Los Angeles Times. Uh, it was written by a man named uh, William Graeber, uh, and the book was by uh, William McKibben. Uh, the book was called The End of Nature. And let me try to enlarge this. Uh, I have this quotation in my own book, and that's what's up here. Uh, well, David, David Graeber, uh, a research biologist with the National Park Service, uh, says this, uh, in his review of Graeber's book. Uh, can you guys see this in the back? Can you see the, the text? Uh, I can try to make it just a little bit larger. Wait a minute. How about now? I can see it. Okay. Should I read it or... Okay, uh, this man's remaking the earth by degrees makes what is happening no less tragic for those of us who value wildness for its own sake, the wildness for its own sake, not for what value it confers upon mankind. That's the intrinsic value doctrine. Uh, I, for one, cannot wish upon either my children or the rest of earth's biota, this is child and then other biota are worms and uh, tsetse flies and so forth, uh, I cannot uh, wish upon either my children or the rest of Earth's biota a tame planet, be it monstrous or, however unlikely, benign. McKibben is a biocentrist, and biocentrist means uh, an intrinsic value supporter, and so am I. We are not interested in the utility of a particular species or free-flowing river or ecosystem to mankind. They have intrinsic value, more value, to me, how do we get that, uh, than another human body or a billion of them. <laughs> human happiness and certainly human fecundity are not as important as a wild and healthy planet. I know social scientists who remind me that people are part of nature, but it isn't true. Somewhere along the line, at about <laughs> a, a billion years ago, maybe half that, uh, we quit the contract and became a cancer. We have become a plague upon ourselves and upon the earth. 
it is cosmi- cosmically unlikely that the developed world that the developed world will choose to end its orgy of fossil energy consumption and the third world its suicidal consumption of landscape until such time as homo sapiens should decide to rejoin nature some of us can only hope for the right virus to come along <laughs> the right virus to do what well to get rid of the billion human beings that this character considers of lesser value uh, than uh, a wild planet. Now, uh, here you have people who are saying uh, nature is of intrinsic value, yet they sneak in some more value to me. What he's actually saying is he doesn't give a damn about the existence of a billion people, plus or minus. They're of no consequence to him. Now, I think it's perfectly comparable to someone saying, uh, my value is the gas clouds on Jupiter. That's what I'm concerned with. Uh, That has intrinsic value, and uh, the human race can perish. (laughs) Now, uh, I think this is a mask uh, for unbelievable hostility, hatred of the human race. There is only one possible basis on which things can be of value to human beings, and that is it has to be uh, make some contribution to human life and well-being. That's the source of the value of all other things. But there are people, there are a lot of people who have a lot of anger, hatred, hostility. Uh, You can find evidence of them throughout history. Uh, There were uh, crowds in the Roman arena that got a lot of fun out of watching uh, people being eaten alive by wild beasts. Uh, There were people in the Middle Ages uh, who got a, a big kick out of watching other people burn alive at the stake. And we've had uh, mass butchery and murder uh, not all that long ago in Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, Cambodia, uh, mainland China. Uh, The world has no shortage of uh, vicious, uh, uh, human-hating monsters. And I think that uh, the intellectual core of environmentalism and its doctrine of intrinsic value is really of the same character. They're really not concerned about the environment or anything like that. They're concerned with making life difficult for the rest of the human race. And that's uh, their, their whole perspective. Now, uh, let's consider uh, the mode of operation of the environmentalists. Now, what they do is they take for granted the enormous positive of the products that we have, our standard of living, uh, they take that totally for granted and uh, they ignore it. And here, uh, I'd like to ask you, I make a reference in point four. Uh, You've heard the expression, all of you, stop and smell the roses. Well, uh, something that uh, no one ever suggests is, uh, take a moment, stop and appreciate the products. Just think of the uh, kind of economic world that we live in. Uh, I I imagine if you're an American, uh, there's a very good chance you already own your own automobile. Or if you don't, uh, you probably very soon will. Or your parents do. Now just think of what it means. uh, You walk out of some place, you walk a few feet into a parking lot, Uh, You get into your car, you turn a key, in a few minutes you're off driving down a superhighway at 65 or 70 miles an hour. You turn on a radio, or uh, you can have your iPod connected to it now or whatever, and you can be listening uh, to uh, a symphony orchestra or uh, or an opera, and you're hearing beautiful beautiful music. It can be a terribly hot night, Uh, you're driving in air-conditioned comfort or uh, most of you flew here. Uh, You were 30,000 feet or more up in the air. Uh, Maybe you were drinking a martini, or maybe not of the legal age yet. Uh, You were watching a movie. Now, uh, try to put yourself back, uh, say, 100 or 200 years, and imagine describing this uh, to someone living at that time. Uh, My point is, uh, we are living... Uh, in an age that not very long ago was the realm of science fiction. We're living in a world of routine economic miracles and hardly anyone uh, has any appreciation for it. 
Uh, when you get out of your car, you go home, it's dark, you open your door, you flick a switch, the room is flooded with light. Uh, you go, you open a refrigerator, uh, you have food from halfway around the world. Uh, you go, you flick another switch, you have a television program that comes on uh, showing God knows what from halfway around the world. Uh, you can take a, a hot shower. Uh, you have central heating, air conditioning, running hot and cold uh, water. These are incredible things. Uh, the environmentalists, uh, uh, they have no appreciation for this at all. Uh, they totally ignore it. And what they focus on are not at all the products, but here and there, uh, uh, occasional, comparatively trivial negative byproducts. And that's their total focus. So if we have all of this totality of incredible wonders, they're not concerned with that at all. What they're concerned with is their fear, well, maybe the temperature of the world is going up two degrees. And we better mobilize everybody, control their every actions, take away all of this in order to prevent the rise in temperature. That's how they focus on things. So uh, the way I put it is, well, it's even more than that, uh, to get some further idea of the nature of what's going on, uh, all of the actions that we undertake, uh, why does an individual uh, perform a job? Why does he produce anything? Why do you take a job? Why would you be in business uh, to produce anything? What's your motive? But you want to benefit yourself, right? Now, if you're in business and you're producing something, you can't uh, point a gun at people and get them to buy from you, give, the, give you their money at the, under a point of a gun. What do you have to do to get people to buy from you? We have to produce something that they value more than the money you're asking them to pay. How do you get suppliers to supply you or workers to work for you? You have to offer them money they value above uh, whatever it is they're selling to you. So uh, in any uh, private voluntary economic undertaking, we have uh, three sets of beneficiaries. We have uh, the uh, producer himself, his customers, and his suppliers. Three, these are three sets of parties benefiting. Now, uh, there might be uh, some outside party uh, who uh, possibly might suffer some harm, and what I always think of as an example, I remember when I went to graduate school, uh, the, we had a very old building, I mentioned that last night, and they were starting to construct a new building right across the street. But the construction of the new building was delayed for quite a while because the owner of an adjacent building where they were excavating the foundation uh, claimed that uh, the excavation was jeopardizing the foundation of her building. And so she got a uh, court restraining order until that could be worked out. So this was an outside party who was uh, threatened with some harm. Well, whenever there is some outside party who is threatened with harm uh, by the voluntary actions of the producer, his suppliers and customers, uh, if there is something demonstrable, uh, that party has uh, a legal remedy. But uh, the environmentalists are not concerned with cases like that. Their focus is cases where there is no such outside party. No one uh, who can... Uh, present any kind of recognizable grievance. What they specialize in is cases in which the different individuals involved are not producing any perceptible negative effects on anybody. They're just benefiting themselves and those with whom they deal. But if you add up the actions of millions of such cases, maybe there is some negative that now adds up to something. In effect, we have uh, gallons and gallons of good and maybe tiny uh, microscopic droplets of bad that no one can perceive. But when we multiply these transactions by a sufficiently large number, the tiny microscopic droplet, droplets of bad now add up to a quart of bad. Well, uh, and now the environmentalists jump in and they zero in on that quart and they want to stop the production of all of the uh, hundreds and thousands of millions of gallons of good. And let me give you uh, a hypothetical example of this. Uh, 150 years ago or so, 
the American Midwest was being settled. And as uh, hundreds of thousands of farmers and their families moved west, uh, they cut down an awful lot of trees. They cleared land to establish farms. Now, it may be that when you uh, clear so much land of so many trees, that uh, the water no longer had uh, enough place to go. And so maybe uh, the Mississippi River now had to carry more water downstream. And maybe this uh, caused some additional flooding down at New Orleans. Well, now notice... Uh, no individual farmer in his family, uh, is he responsible for flooding down at New Orleans? No, but if you have millions of them, well, maybe now uh, some floods result. Well, if, the, if we had had an environmental movement back in those days, they would have tried to stop the development of the Midwest in order to avoid the flooding down at New Orleans. And they would have held all of the farmers uh, responsible for that negative environmental impact. Well, I think that's exactly the same situation with global warming. We have hundreds of millions of people going about their business, uh, benefiting themselves, those with whom they deal. And maybe, I don't think it's proved, but let's concede it for the sake of argument, that the byproduct of all of this activity may be that uh, the mean temperature of the world will be a little bit higher than it otherwise would have been. And the environmentalists zero in on that. They ignore the totality of all of the homes, automobiles, uh, light, power, whatever, uh, that uh, underlies this, and they focus only on uh, the negative of the higher temperature and whatever might go with it. And then they think, voila, it follows. We have the right to demand an immediate 60% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. Well, uh, that's uh, their mode of procedure. And what's remarkable here, there's a, an additional aspect. You know, uh, the environmentalists uh, are highly distrustful of science and technology. Uh, they regard atomic power as the death ray. So uh, nothing will ever make them feel safe with atomic power. Uh, they're terrified of pesticides. Uh, they, they don't even trust science and technology to produce a loaf of bread that is safe if it has chemical preservatives. But there's one aspect of science and technology that they have the most incredible confidence in, and that's weather forecasting for the next 100 years. And on the basis of that, uh, they're willing to tear down modern industrial civilization. Now, uh, let me try uh, to provide a different uh, perspective on these cases. And here I come uh, to this heading, environmentalism, collectivism, and socialism, and I'll try as quickly as I can to indicate some respects in which environmentalism is uh, permeated by collectivism. One is uh, it holds individuals responsible uh, for the negative byproducts resulting from the actions of the collective uh, to which they belong. So uh, here we are, you and I, I'm not responsible for global warming, you're not responsible, General Motors is not responsible, But if you add up the actions of maybe a billion or three billion people, maybe uh, you might have some contribution. Well, the environmentalists proceed as though uh, the different individuals who make up this collective, that they're responsible. This is another irony. Uh, The same uh, collectivist mentality, if some individual murders another individual in cold blood, he's not responsible. It's Uh, the society that has caused him to grow up in bad conditions, they're responsible. But you and I are responsible for global warming. I'm not quite clear on how uh, they manage this this, uh, switcheroo, but uh, I know it it proceeds from the same underlying premise. So they assume that the individuals are responsible and therefore they have a right to stop them. Now, I would suggest that the appropriate procedure in such cases, whether it's global warming or flooding down at New Orleans or whatever, is when you can't show that uh, individuals are responsible for any perceptible negative effects, but it's only great masses of people acting separately and independently, we should regard those negative outcomes as the equivalent of acts of nature. Nature causes flooding. Nature can change the temperature. Uh, Sooner or later, Nature all by itself 
uh, will make the temperature warmer or colder. So if we have uh, unintended uh, byproducts of the action of masses of human beings, I would say the reasonable way to regard that is as the equivalent of an act of nature. And then we should respond as we would to any other act of nature. And uh, maybe we need uh, to have more air conditioners to deal with global warming. Uh, more uh, sunblock, whatever. Also, what you need, the real solution, once you view it as needing to respond to an act of nature, the basic solution is going to be economic freedom. You, you see, the problem can be solved if nature is changing the climate. Uh, we will solve the problem if we are all individually free to respond in a way that is best for us. So uh, farmers may have to change the crops they're growing. Uh, some areas will become better for some things. Others will be poorer for other things. Uh, people may need to relocate factories or whatever. Uh, there might be some parts of the world that uh, can't support so much population. But then uh, central Canada would open up. Uh, southern Greenland, uh, parts of uh, the former uh, Soviet Union. Uh, there'd be a changed set of circumstances. And the way to deal with that is uh, not by global government control, They've tried that. Uh, they can't grow enough wheat or produce enough nails. Uh, don't let the same people uh, attempt to, to solve the problem of global warming or anything of that kind. And uh, this is uh, where they're collectivist again. They think, they view a problem. They see a problem and they think, oh my God, some official in a bureau in Washington needs to solve this. How can this be done? It's overwhelming. Well, uh, imagine that we had viewed other problems that way. Suppose we put ourselves back about 105 years and we start to realize, you know, the automobile is coming. Uh, right now, uh, there's only a handful of them, but there's going to be millions of automobiles and we're going to need incredible highways and uh, the uh, horses, what's going to happen to all the horse breeders, the oat growers, the blacksmiths, how are we going to adjust to this? This is a terrible calamity. <laughs> or uh, uh, agriculture is going to decline. Uh, we have 60% of the population living in agriculture, but in 100 years, we're only going to have 3%. Where are these people going to go? Uh, who's going to feed them? Well, you see, it's looking at things from a collectivist mentality. And I'd say the whole problem of global warming and all of these other things uh, there might be some actual physical issue involved, but there is no real problem. The real problem is a collectivist mentality. Uh, it's too big a problem for any government bureaucrat to cope with, but if you have hundreds of millions of free individuals, each one seeking to uh, solve his particular part, do what's best for him, that's how we solve the problems. It gets all integrated and harmonized through the price system. Uh, just a few words more uh, on environmentalism and, and socialism. I think there's a profound similarity. Uh, all you have to do is uh, substitute the, the concretes. Uh, both of them, uh, according to environmentalism, environmentalism and socialism, uh, the individuals have to be stopped from pursuing their own individual happiness, their own individual self-interest. That's the basic idea. The, the government has to stop us uh, from doing what we would otherwise want to do. Now, the socialists said the government needed to stop us uh, from uh, exploiting one another, uh, underpaying the workers, from uh, establishing monopolies, causing unemployment. The environmentalists are saying, no, no, that's not the reason. Now we have to stop people to avoid global warming, ozone depletion, and acid rain. But it's still the same solution, just uh, switching the concretes. Now, uh, I, think, I think of environmentalism as essentially being socialism stripped of its veneer of science. Uh, the socialists uh, used to pride themselves on social engineering. Uh, two generations ago, the socialists were talking about social engineering. They finally realized that th what the end result of this was the gulag and tens of millions of people slaughtered. So they lost their taste uh, for social engineering. But now they've turned to uh, despising engineering of any kind. 
they don't make the distinction. Uh, they uh, blame, I think, uh, a major root of environmentalism is, uh, it, however surprisingly, the failure of socialism in the following way. How did generations of intellectuals regard socialism? They thought of it as scientific socialism. That was another name for Marxism, scientific socialism. So what did they think reason and science implied? Well, reason and science implied a socialist society. Well, where did that lead? To mass death and destruction. Well, instead of ever waking up and realizing that they didn't know what reason and science were, they never read Mises or anyone like that, they still think that reason and science imply socialism, death and destruction, and they don't trust reason and science in any area. Uh, they, they have the same, they have a suspicion and hostility to science and technology in every area, and I think it derives, if not entirely, at least in good measure, from the uh, total failure of socialism, which they regard as uh, being scientific and rational. Well, I'll just uh, make one uh, concluding uh, statement here, uh, which I recognize I've not given sufficient support for, but if you care to know my ideas on this subject further, I hope you'll read chapter three of my book, which deals with this. And I conclude that the real problem of the world today is not at all uh, environmental pollution, it's philosophical corruption. And it's the philosophical corruption that is causing people uh, to see such uh, fictitious problems as environmental pollution and, and many other things of this kind. Okay, well, uh, I think I've reached the end of the hour. I don't know if you have any questions. 